believe starting, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I would like to share some things with you that have been on my mind the past few days. And I'm gonna start reading Romans chapter 14 and I'm going to read the whole chapter actually. So bear with me please. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but, do, but not quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day, observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and give, gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, <coughs> that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account to himself, of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer but rather decide whether or not to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So as I was reading this, I was thinking, you know, sometimes you see when, when people come to the Lord and they are born again and they become Christians, <clears throat> they start adapting all these rules. This is what I have to do to be in good standing with God. And what does that do? That puts the focus on the person rather than what God said he did for us. That's diminishing the death burial and resurrection of Jesus because it's basically saying I know that you did this for me so that I could be saved I could be reckoned to God <clears throat> however it's not enough for me to be in good standing with God because I have to do this and then that's the people that have that mentality that's when they start judging others that all they do is believe God trust him and recognize that yes every day you're going to screw up somehow but as long as you recognize that you continue to make an effort to grow as a person, the judge is not going to bring a hammer down and condemn you for eternity. And some people think that. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 
15, it says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you receive and which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. So we are reconciled to God through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. There's nothing that we can do that is going to get us any closer to God than what Christ did. make sure that we continue to spend time with the Lord and listen to what he has to say to us by reading his word and letting the Holy Spirit reveal to us what it is that we're supposed to understand about this that's going to continue to make us grow and get us closer to him Romans 12 2 says do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Stop, po stop putting the focusing, excuse me, stop putting the focus on yourself or on others or on your circumstances or your surroundings and put the focus back where it should be. Amen. Amen. Philippians 1, verse 6 says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. But going back to Philippians 1, Verse 6. No, sorry, that's the wrong scripture. I apologize. Back to 2 Corinthians 3. It says, are being transformed. So I looked up in the dictionary that particular phrase, are being. And it says that that is the present progressive passive tense of the word being. <coughs> which basically says it shows an action that is temporary or an ongoing activity. There's some people that think, okay, now that I'm saved, that I gave my life to Christ, everything has been fixed. But that's not the reality something that the Lord continues to do for us every day as we continue to pursue him until the day that we die and we go to him and as I read in Romans 12 you know it says that he that started the work in you will finish it so why are we in such a rush to be perfected when it's just such a joy to spend time with the Lord and continue to grow as, as Christians and continue to have this revelation. You know, sometimes I think that when, when people give their life to the Lord, it's like, okay, now that I did this, everything is done. My life can end here right now. Instead of just allowing yourself to continue to explore that relationship and continue to grow and, and all this joy that comes from being a child of God and, and being transformed, renewed, <coughs> changed into this new person. Let's just believe what the Lord says he's going to do and put the focus on him rather than on ourselves. And our relationship with him is going to be much more satisfying. Amen. So hopefully that makes sense to you as it did to me. Yeah. Yeah.
yesterday as I was meditating on this. Thank you. 
speaking of young ones, I, I just thank the Lord for uh, the three young ladies who uh, come on Wednesday night. They're 12 and 13 years old and, and uh, are singing with us now, along with my granddaughter, our granddaughter, and two of her friends. And uh, We know it's the beginning of God, what God wants to do. They won't start a youth group. In fact, they have started a youth group. Let's just put it that way. And uh, I'm, I'm praying for uh, their hearts to be touched. I'm praying for them to be transformed. Uh, that they would understand that there are light in the darkness in their middle school. Uh, they go to three different middle schools, but they're friends from when they were younger. Um, so they're every they live in Altoona, Des Moines, and walk uh, out west Des Moines. So just pray that the Lord watch over them and that uh, this tender thing that has started with them would continue on. That we would nurture them, that we would show the love of Christ, that we would support them, and uh, let the let the work continue. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Yes, John. Yeah, I thank the Lord that uh, we just have his word to guide us. We can come here and uh, hear the word and hear the encouragement and testimonies. You know, it just uh, lifts you up and you realize that uh, we're here for one another. And when one gets Distracted, or uh, you know, something happens in their life to uh, get them uh, off track, or whatever it is that's going on in any of our lives, that uh, we can be refocused, like we were saying mm -hmm. earlier. You know, we can just start over. Every day is a new day, an opportunity with the Lord that He can redirect you in the way that you need to go. And should go and everything's okay in God uh, no matter what's going on in the world God's got uh, a better plan and we just need to get more in tune with it and I just thank God that we have uh, such a uh, loving God you know, who directs us and uh, he's the conductor of this uh, sympathy, sympathy need that we're in and uh, we're all a part you know it makes a beautiful sound because of God's uh, mercy and grace and I just thank God that uh, a better day is ahead you know, no matter what we go through we got so much to look forward to and uh, God's going to get it done we just trust him and uh, I just thank God for his people and his way and uh, his truth that prevails praise God Amen Salvation, Lord, we thank you for the revelation that you give us through your word, the word that we speak out into this world because we know it carries your power, Lord, and it has the power to change every situation. Father, we declare the healing on those that are in need of healing right now. We know that you promised that healing to us, and we are your children. Father, we pray for the job situation. You open the door for us to walk through to 
new and better opportunity. New, better situation. For those that are traveling, keep them safe. Let your light shine through them and carry your word wherever they go so that whoever they meet is touched by you, Father. Your voice and worship the Lord.
Hallelujah. 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 Yes, the river has changed in this room. Um, if we don't yield to his changes, then we'll wind up on a beach somewhere. So let's just enter in and focus on the Lord. I also want to lift up uh, Tim and Lee. Lee was not feeling well. She battles with diabetes, so we need to uh, pray for her healing. Uh, for Toby and Jody that are suffering in <laughs> Jamaica, Jamaica, I was told Jamaica, Jamaica, Rathbun, whatever, and others like Eric and Rita and Kennedy and Addie and all those and Tammy, um, there's so many missing right now. Naturally, pastor, traveling mercies. But the Lord wants to do something right now in this place. Take it, Roberto.
and I cry, holy, holy are you, Lord. And I cry, holy, holy are you,
loving kindness. Oh 
thank you for your presence this morning. Thank you for the river that flows freely from heaven. Thank you for your fountain of grace that you purchased with your very own blood. I thank you that we can come before you just as we are this morning and expect that your presence will reign in this place, that we can expect to worship you in spirit and truth, face to face. We thank you for all those gathered here today. Bless those who can't be with us. Be with us for the remainder of this service in Jesus' name. Well, thank you, worship team. <laughs> I always feel silly saying that. <laughs> well, I was a little anxious because I didn't feel like my message was finished. <laughs> and my message is titled, It is Finished. <laughs> Doesn't God have a sense of humor? <laughs> But the, the whole gist of my entire message, as Roberto said, all, all that he said today is summed up in this. Just believe. Isn't that all God wants from us is to just believe? And that's why we can just trust in him and rest, to know that it is finished. So Roberto texted me on well, Friday or Saturday, I don't remember, and I had literally just been praying, Lord, what do you, what, what's on your heart? Because it's so much easier when it's his words that I'm just repeating to you versus me searching and thinking and wondering. And I just, all he said was, it is finished. Okay, Lord, usually he gives me an outline. Usually I know where I'm going. It's finished. And isn't that just like our God? Simple, sweet, and to the point. There's nothing confusing about his good news. There's nothing that the children downstairs can't understand. There's nothing that we, there's no revelation we need, there's no theory, there's no college course, there's nothing we need just to know that he loves us and he's finished it all for us and he's made it so easy. That's why it's called the free gift. That's why it's called the good news. Who doesn't like gifts and presents? Children love presents, right? And our Father loves to give good gifts. So much revelation, so much power, and so much of himself in such a simple phrase, it is finished. That's why it's called the good news. And so I said, all right, Lord, so what's finished? <laughs> and he said, creation. So today we're going to take a journey from Genesis chapter 1 <laughs> to Revelation chapter 22. And I promise I won't talk about everything in between. <laughs> but it's finished. The beginning is finished. The middle is finished, and the end is finished. Like, he's written the story. We are just to walk it out and find our place in his story. So, creation. And it struck me that the first creation was man in God's creation. It was man as God's creation and man in God's creation. And it was perfect. It was perfect. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And I always think of Tim. He always says, in the beginning, God. Isn't that all we need to know? The first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God. I, I hear him saying that over and over, and it's so true. In the beginning, God. The rest works itself out. And for six days, God created all that was. He created light, and light was. He spoke, right? God's creative force was speaking the word. Just like you said, Jane, God spoke the word. He didn't think it. He didn't read it. He spoke it. That's the power. And that's the creative force that is still at work today. So God said, light, and light was. God said, let there be firmament. And he created the heavens. And he separated the heavens from the earth. And then he created the earth, and he rolled back the seas to, create, to show the dry land. And then he put the sun and the moon to, to show us the, the light and the stars in the sky. And then he created every living creature that moves in the sea and in the sky, the fowl of the air. And on the sixth day, God created the beasts of the earth and he created mankind. Genesis 1, 26 through 31. Uh, yes, Genesis 1, 26 through 31. 
And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed upon, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yield... Ugh. Let me say that again. In the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God doesn't create anything on accident. And God doesn't create the bad. God said it was good. Everything that God has made is good. Yes. Everything that God has made is still good today, although be it in its fallen condition. And that was the sixth day. And we all know what God did on the seventh day. God rested. And he declared the seventh day to be holy. Yes, and I'm always struck by the thought that God took Adam. Well, okay, so let's read it. So uh, Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. And then I'm going to go with 7 through 17. Genesis 2, 1 through 3. And then we'll go to Genesis 2, 7 through 17. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. And then let's go to 2, 7 through 17. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man who he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. And the name of the first was, I'm going to just, the river. <laughs> just forgive me, I'm going to skip over the name. <laughs> Uh, that is it which compasseth the whole land where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is lots of good things in stone <laughs> in the land. And the name of the second river. And the same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. I know that one. And the name of the third river. And that is it which goes toward the east. And the fourth river is Euphrates. I know that one too. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So even though I can't pronounce the rivers, it sounds like a wonderful place. There's gold. There's beautiful stones. There's onyx. God, there's not a single thing that, that man did. God didn't, man didn't plant it, man didn't water it, man didn't harvest it, man just was to abide in it and enjoy the fruit thereof. Mm -hmm. All but one tree, yep. one tree. And when God created Adam, that living soul, that very first living soul, he breathed his breath into his nostrils. nostrils. That one breath, has sustained all of mankind. That, I say that over and over again, but it blows my mind every time I think about it. One time, God breathed into Adam, and that same breath is the spark of life that scientists are trying to recreate in every way they can imagine. But it was the one breath of God, so powerful that it has sustained mankind, every person on this planet. That single breath of God was so powerful that it is that same breath that has sparked life in all of us today. Every single soul around the globe shares that same breath, that same spark of life. 
Every citizen of humanity is one of God's grandchildren. Great, 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 great grandchildren. And that is why every single soul is precious to God. But God's creation, Adam and Eve, they didn't understand their creator. Adam and Eve were lied to. They were tricked by the serpent in the garden. They were told that God was holding something back with that one thing. He said, just don't do this one thing. It's not good for you. But they didn't understand their creator. Why would, and so the serpent, right? The serpent, who believes a snake over God? <laughs> like, like, if you just think about it. They were told that God was withholding a blessing through his rules, right? Does this lie sound familiar? that God will withhold a blessing when we don't do something or don't follow the rules or don't understand the rules, that even heaven itself is withheld if we don't measure up. That's not what God said. The enemy knows the scriptures very well and he twists them. He turns the gifts of God, the gift of grace, the gift of the garden into a paycheck, right? Something you have to earn. The enemy whispers, you aren't worthy God won't bless you. He can't. He's holy and you're not. If you do this or if you don't do that, God will or God won't do that. The difference is subtle but deadly. It can't be a gift if it's earned. And God doesn't expect us to be perfect. He expects us to trust in his perfection. Have you ever thought, if only Adam and Eve had taken one more walk in the garden with God, Mm. if they just would have stopped And they had the question, they had the doubt, they looked at the tree, the fruit looked good. And they were confused. Well, what did God really say? Eve didn't quote it properly. (laughs) The serpent didn't quote it properly. But they just, they didn't understand their creator. They didn't even think to go and be with him and ask him. If they just would have gone to the garden and taken that walk with him one more time, would they have realized the trick of the enemy? Would they have asked God himself? God cares for us. It's okay for us to have doubts. He wants us to come to him with our questions and our fears. He's a good father and he gives good gifts. He's given us his word of truth, a lamp into our feet to guide and direct our paths. He's placed his Holy Spirit within our hearts to give us wisdom and insight into his kingdom. And he gave us each other to encourage and edify one another through worship and testimonies and prayer and fellowship. But Adam and Eve, they didn't take one more walk in the garden. They did not come to God with their questions, with their doubts and their fears. They ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And for their own good, God was forced to cut them off and send them out from the garden into a cursed and fallen world. So instead... 2,000 years later, Jesus Christ came and he took a walk in a different garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. It's a very different walk in a very different garden, but he walked in our place and he opened the way for salvation, God in man's creation. God didn't leave us in our fallen state. Through generations, God selected a bloodline full of imperfect people who their only redeeming quality was that they trusted God. Think about all of the characters. Why why are their their shortcomings outlined for us? Why are they written down? Why do we know? God wants it clear that it wasn't their personal integrity. It wasn't their personal character. It wasn't their moral rectitude, their personal righteousness that won his regard. It was their total and complete confidence in God and in his word. Just a few of the memorable people in the lineage of Jesus Christ, including four Gentile women who were grafted in, Abraham, who gave his wife to a king. Jacob, who stole his brother's birthright. Rahab, a harlot, a Gentile woman who harbored Joshua and the spies in Jericho. Ruth, a Gentile, through the kinsman redeemer Boaz. And David, through a Gentile Bathsheba, whose husband he had murdered so he could have her for his own. Until we reach a a young woman named Mary, who is betrothed to a carpenter named Joseph. God himself came down to earth in his fallen state, made by man's own hand, and robed himself in flesh and chooses this young lady from all others. What was special about Mary? 
Why did God choose her? Because she believed when the angel said, for with God nothing shall be impossible. And her reply, be it unto me according to thy word. Let that be our heart response to everything in God's word. Be it unto me according to thy word. That is all God wants to hear from us still today. Be it unto me according to your word, Lord. And with the birth of Jesus in a lowly manger, in a strange town, to a young engaged couple, probably fearing for their life, God's humility, God's great love for his creation, God's perfect justice, and God's unfathomable gift of grace were revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus knows his purpose and he knows his Father's plan to usher in an age of salvation, to set the captives free, to secure the redemption of mankind and of all creation, the revelation of a recreation, a new kind of humanity, a new heaven and a new earth. But Jesus also knew the price of this precious gift. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus prayed. Matthew 26, 36 through 29, 39, sorry. Matthew 26, 36 through 39. Then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Jesus knew what he was about to endure. And he said, the, the, the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. What do we do in those hard times when we're facing those situations? Do we want to talk about the situation or do we come to God? What did he do? He went, he gathered his friends, his fellow believers. He went to the garden and he prayed. And he sought his father face to face. And he said, I can't do it without you. That's what he was really saying. I can't do this without you. Father, strengthen me. Encourage me. Fill me with what I need to endure. I will drink from this cup. I will drink from this cup if it's what it has to be. And Jesus did. He drank from the cup of sorrow. He was beaten, bruised, and crucified as an innocent man a lamb sent to the slaughter for the sins of others, a perfect sacrifice without spot, without blemish, perfect in the eyes of God, an acceptable sacrifice, the last sacrifice creation ever needed. The blood of Jesus was not sprinkled on the mercy seat in the temple like in the days of Moses. The blood of Jesus was sprinkled on the very throne of God in heaven once for all eternity. And with his sacrifice and with his words, Jesus Christ gave up the ghost and finished the work of his father who sent him. John 19, 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was a set of vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. And when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I command my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Psalm 31, 5. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Redemption was complete. 
redemption, salvation, restoration, recreation, healing, you name it, it was completed. But that's not the end of the story. Jesus rose again and is alive forevermore in our hearts, in heaven, in all of creation. And with it, the rebirth of a new creation. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That gives me such comfort because I have the memories of my old nature. I have the flesh of this body that has done some things and still continues to do some things that aren't righteous, that aren't holy. But I am a new creation. God is in me, and it's his presence that makes me holy. Not my acts, not my deeds, not my thoughts, not my intentions. It is his presence alone, his sacrifice that makes me holy, righteous, acceptable, perfect. We are kings and priests. I don't know about you, but my bank account isn't what it looks like to be a king. <laughs> my wardrobe isn't that of a priest. But I am a royal race. We are a royal race. Revelation 1, I'll read this out of the Amplified, actually. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful and trustworthy witness, the firstborn of the dead, first to be brought back to life, and the prince, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him whoever loves us and has once for all loosed and freed us from our sins by his own blood, and formed us into a kingdom, a royal race, priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the power and the majesty and the dominion throughout the ages and forever and ever. Amen. So be it. Kings don't work. Kings don't plant and, and weed and water. Priests, what was their job? They were forbidden to work in the Old Testament. We are kings and priests. It is as if we have been placed back in the garden. It is God that gives the increase. It is God that makes the way. We just simply walk in it. I've never understood how... Do we mature and grow, but yet we don't do anything? <laughs> we don't. It's not, there's no work left to be done. But we are yet to walk it out and finish our own stories. And redemption. I'm going to read this um, out of the Amplified. It's Isaiah 61. I can sort of read it. <laughs> My printer had a malfunction. 61 from the, the I think this is the Message Bible. Uh, Announce freedom to all the captives. The Spirit of God, the Master, is on me because God anointed me. He sent me to preach good news to the poor, heal the broken, heart heartbroken, announce freedom to all captives, all prisoners. God sent me to announce the year of his grace, a celebration of God's destruction of our enemies, and to, conf and to comfort all who mourn to care for the needs of all who mourn in Zion, give them bouquets of roses instead of ashes, messages of joy instead of news of doom, a praising heart instead of a languid spirit, rename them oaks of righteousness planted by God to display his glory. You are oaks of righteousness. You are the display of God's glory. They'll rebuild the old ruins and raise a new city out of the wreckage. They'll start over on the ruined cities and make to take the rubble left behind and they'll make it new. You'll hire outsiders to herd your flocks and foreigners to work your fields. But you'll have the title of priests of God, honored as ministers of our God. You'll feast on the bounty of nations. You'll bask in their glory. Because you got a double dose of trouble and more than your share of contempt, your inheritance in the land will be doubled and your joy will go on forever. Because I, God, love fair dealing and hate thievery and crime, I'll pay your wages on time and in full and establish my eternal covenant with you. Your descendants will become well known all over. Your children in foreign countries will be recognized at once as the people I have blessed. I will sing for joy in God, explode in praise from deep in my soul. 
He dressed me up in a suit of salvation. He outfitted me in a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom puts on a tuxedo and a bride a jeweled tiara. For as the earth bursts forth with spring wildflowers, and as a garden cascades and blossoms, so the master, God, brings righteousness into full bloom and puts praise on display before the nations. It is finished. God has done it all. And it's not a paycheck anymore. God paid the price. There's no more pay for work. It's an inheritance. It is an inheritance that we have already received the down payment of. This is the rest that God promised us in his word. And as a reminder that there's nothing left for us, for, let nothing left for us to do. In the days of Moses, the law stated that no work should be done in the Sabbath. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. We abide in him completely, every day, every moment. Uh, Psalm 127 out of the Amplified. Psalm 127, the vanity of work without God. Except the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Except the Lord keeps the city, the watchman wakes but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to take rest late, to eat the bread of anxious toil, for he gives blessings to his beloved in sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord and the fruit of the womb a reward. As arrows are in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy, blessed, and fortunate is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they speak with their adversaries in gatherings at the city's gate. God wants to bless us while we're asleep. You don't have to do it. What do we do in our sleep? I snore. I don't know about you. I snore in my sleep. God's blessing me while I'm snoring, driving my husband crazy. And what do we do to make a child? Do we create the child? No. We take pleasure in our spouse. And we, we bring forth children in pleasure. God doesn't hate pleasure. God wants us to be fruitful and multiply. And he gave us these things. We don't create the child. We don't make it grow in the mother's womb. God does. And it's in the quiet of his rest that we become intimate with him. And God and I can produce good fruit. That's where the fruit is born. God doesn't grow weary. He doesn't get tired. As Tim always says, he's not there wringing his hand wondering what to do. God simply wants us to stay connected with him and to trust him. Philippians 4, 6 says, be anxious for nothing, but in all things, prayer and supplication to God. Just stay connected with him. Talk to him. The 23rd Psalm is probably one of my favorites. Um, the Amplified reads, the Lord is my shepherd. To feed, guide, and shield me, I shall not lack. He makes me lie down in fresh, tender, green pastures. He leads me beside the still and restful waters. He refreshes and restores my soul, myself. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, uprightness, and right standing with him, not for my earning it, but for his name's sake. Yes, though I walk through the deep, sunless valley of the shadow of death, I will fear or dread no evil, for you are with me, your rod to protect, and your staff to guide. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My brimming cup runs over. Surely, only goodness, mercy, and unfailing love shall follow me all the days of my life. And through the length of my days, the house of the Lord and his presence shall be my dwelling place. If that's not a picture of the garden, I don't know what is. Still waters, tender grass. The, I think, Sally, you posted the sound of rain on a tin roof, the sound of the babbling brook, the river, the, the green grass, the smell of the grass, the, the sound of the birds. That's perfection. That's peace. That's rest. That's where God wants us to live, in his presence. So what is the finished work? It's freedom for whoever will receive God's free gift. God's, God, lo God so loved the earth that he gave his only begotten son. This is how we have confidence to say, it is well with my soul. 
There's a song. There's a song that we're learning. If I can get my printer to not print blue paper. It is well with my soul. It's a, it's a new take on the old hymn. And the old hymn is written by Horatio Spiro. I don't know where my notes are. Huh? Spafford. Oh, sorry. Spafford. There you go. I, wrote, I have that one. He was a lawyer from Chicago. And uh, his wife, Anna, and he lost a son at the age of four. And a couple years later, he thought his family needed a vacation, so he sent his wife and his four children ahead across the Atlantic on a ship for a vacation. And there was the, the ship wrecked on, his, on its way to um, Europe, and his four children were killed, and just his wife, Anna, remained. And it was on a ship across the Atlantic Ocean to see his wife and mourn the loss of their four children that he wrote the song, It Is Well. When sorrow like sea billows roll, it is well, it is well with my soul. When troubles come knocking, that should be our cry, it is well with my soul. And the new version, so let go my soul and trust in him. The wind and the waves still know his name. Through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, it is well with me. It is well with my soul. The Shulamite woman who understood the power of God's word, she built a room on her house for the man of God. She was blessed with a child when she could not conceive, when it was a miracle, it was a miracle child, and that child died. And she knew one thing, that she needed to get to the man of God. And when he sent his messenger out, when he saw her coming, he said, how is it? with you and your husband and your son. What was her answer? It is well. The woman with the issue of blood, when she just, she saw Jesus and she knew that she could just touch the hem of his garment, that she would be healed. What is it about these people in the Old Testament who had no right to those miracles? They knew if they could just get to him, it would be all right. That they can say, I know that if I can just get to him, not even touch Jesus, but the hem of his garment, I'm healed. The Shulamite woman, as soon as she can see Elijah, it is well, because she knows the man of God gave her a miraculous child, can raise him from the, not a doubt in her mind, she just needed to get to him. We don't have to get to God. We don't have to, to, to fight the crowds to touch the hem of his garment. We don't have to come to a church service and worship. We don't have to do anything other than just say, God, I am healed. I am whole. I am prosperous. It is well with my soul. Speak the words of truth and let them feed our hearts. That's beautiful. Beautiful. It's his word in our heart that we speak out, that he puts back in our heart to encourage ourselves. Does God, what is, what is there left to do? It is finished. And just as our story began with the garden, our story ends with the garden. Revelation 22, 1 through 5. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruit, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, excuse me, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And, sh and, there, shall be no, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Begins with a garden, with a river flowing through it. Jesus walked the garden. He walked man's garden, our fallen garden, to give us the redeemed garden. Mm -hmm. God and man, now us together. There's no, there's no one and the other anymore. We are one. It was man and God's creation, God and man's creation, now God and man are one. He sealed the deal. 
He, he made the covenant with himself. We can't mess it up. We can't do anything to undo it. We can just believe. So it's our job to stay connected, to be wise. If we have troubles, if we have fears, if we have doubts, go to the garden. Rest, ask, seek, knock, it shall be opened. And rest because it is finished. And we can say it is well with our souls. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, be blessed. Have a wonderful holiday weekend, and we'll see you back.